we are in a time which is perhaps witnessing some kind of a civilizational and cultural reawakening renaissance in India. And uh, I would like to begin my talk with an obeisance to Sri Rama, Ramaya Rama Bhadraya Rama Chandraya Vedase, Raghunathaya Nathaya Sitaya Pathaya Namaha. So my first introduction to Rama, uh, Ra Ramayana was through my grandmother during uh, the summer holidays. And she used to read out Prithivasa Ramayana and Kashidasi Mahabharata to me. But <clears throat> what attracted me were the colorful paintings which were as part of the books. Okay, they are our itihasas. They are the fundamental civilizational stories that hold the Indian civilizational together. Now, they are also indispensable books of the Indian polity, of the Indic civilizational heritage and polity. And we all know of Kautilya's Arthashastra, but we are unaware, most of us are perhaps unaware, I won't say unaware of the fact, but we gloss over the fact that in Mahabharata, the largest chunk is Bhishma's discourse to Yudhishthira on how the polity should be shaped and what would be the roles and duties of a king. And this is enshrined in the Book of Peace and the Book of Discipline, the Shanti Parva and the Anusashana Parva. And this is about one-fourth of the Mahabharata. And in one of these discourses, Bhishma goes to the length and says that a king who is unjust should be hounded and killed like a mad dog. He goes on to say that even in Mahabharata. And in Valmiki Ramayana, Valmiki very clearly tells us that that king is unjust who appropriates more than one-sixth of the produce as a tax. So this is the premise where we are looking at things. Then in the Aranya Kanda of Srimad Valmiki Ramayana, Maricha says to Rama, Ravana that Bhagavan Ram is the very embodiment of dharma. He uses the word Bhagavan while telling Ra Ravana about Ram. He is a virtuous person with truthfulness as his valor. He is the king to the entire world, just as how Indra is to all the gods. Ramo Vikrahavan Dharma, Sadhu, Satya Prakar Parakramaha, Raja Sarvasya Lokasya, Deva Namiba Vasavaha. And then there is something very interesting. In the first canto, first parva of Mahabharata, in the Prathama Sarga itself, Valmiki says, as long as the mountains and rivers shall endure upon the earth, so long will the story of Ramayana be told among men. Whoever reads this story of Rama, which is purifying, destructive of sin, holy, and the equal of the Vedas is freed from all sins. No doubt when Ravindra Tagore writes about Bharat's uh, Samaj, he says, and in the history of Varsha also, he says that our kings might have raged wars, but in our mango orchards, the village schoolmaster taught his simple loads, and the Ramayana and the Harikatha was a regular feature in our village temples. This is how the tradition continued. This is something very important, how we continue our civilizational load. Now, today, I am in a leadership academy, but you know, I am not going to give a management talk. I will restrict my talk to the core of Valmiki's Ramayana. I would tell you what Valmiki writes about Sri Rama. So there are these two parts where I want to concentrate and bring it before you. First is Ayodhya Kanda, the book of Ayodhya, that is the second book. And here uh, in the 100th chapter, Sarga, Rama gives instruction. We find Rama gives instruction to Bharata as regards the duties of a king and the polity under an 
ideal monarch under the pretext of inquiring about the welfare of his father and others. Now the stage is Rama has left Ayodhya with Sita and Lakshmana. They have come to the forest. What has happened in Ayodhya after Rama's path leaving? Dasharatha has been in a state of deep grief. Kalidasa very beautifully portrays that grief in his Raghuvamsa. Uh, says Asid, <coughs> Asana Nirvana Pradivarchi Vaushasi, like the flicker of a dying lamp. Dasharatha's condition is that he is about to die. Dasharatha lives his mortal coil. And uh, Bharata lives, refuses to accept the kingship. He lives uh, in search of Sri Rama. He comes in search of Sri Rama. Rama sees Bharata. Bharata is it matted locks, wearing bark robes. He comes with joint palms. He lies on the ground. Ground. He is incapable of you know, dissolute with the world. Okay. And Rama finds it difficult to recognize his own brother because who has become pale, his face is emaciated and then Rama takes him by the arm and uh, he makes him, places him on his lap and uh, he inquires of him that, oh my darling brother, tell me, why have you come to the forest leaving our father in Ayodhya? You should not have come to the forest leaving our father in Ayodhya. And um, why have you come wearing this mournful face? So, uh, Bharata says that the king is not alive. He has, the miserable king has departed to the other world all of a sudden. Okay. Uh, so, Rama starts telling him, that brother, I hope the eternal kingdom has no in no way suffered from your youthful experience. I hope you are rendering service okay, in a valiant manner. And you should continue the service of our forefathers who have performed the valiant sacrifice like the Ashwamedha and the Rajasurya. You are a preceptor of the Ikshwaku race who you are well versed in the scriptures, you know the sacred scriptures, so you should uh, remember the sacred scriptures and you should rule with virtue, you should rule with splendor. And you should also take care of the queens, Kausalya and Sumitra, and because you and you should also take care of the venerable queen Kaikeyi. See, here you get the quality of Sri Rama. Rama is, we call Rama Maryada Purushottam. Rama is Maryada Purushottama when he, he doesn't become Maryada Purushottama all of a sudden. He becomes Maryada Purushottama when he is able to leave his crown. He, he is to be anointed a crown prince, but one word from his parents, he is able to leave his crown and come out from the palace with his wife. That Lakshmana accompanies him is a different story. That is a Lakshmana sacrifice. Okay. But that is how he becomes Maryada Purushottam, the first instance. And in this guise, Rama continues his advice to Bharata. He says, like, you should be rich in humility. You are the son of a noble family. You are knowledgeable in many scriptures and you should be unenvious. And you should be full of insights so that every one whom he, everybody looks up to him. So once when I had got into this field, my teacher explained to him, who is a Raja? Raja is one who is a Loka Ranjana, one who survives to the delight of his people. Okay. So he is basically that. That is why, you know, if you re go into details of Ramayana, Bharata performs the, sorry, uh, Janaka Maharshi performs the Yajna so that he takes off all the blame before the actual cultivation begins. And during the cultivation, seed sowing, 
huh? you're plowing all the little animals, seeds, worms that are killed, he will take the entire sin on him so that his people are not affected by those killing of insects in the ground during the plowing season. So that is why he performs the, that is the responsibility of a king. So much a king has to do. And then he goes on exp explaining that he should continue Agnihotra, the fire sacrifice. He should employ a Brahmin who is well-versed in tradition, who is not only well-versed in tradition, but in intelligence and just, and he should be able to inform him and the fire tradition should be continued and the oblation should be faith to the father and you should be holding the gods in high esteem and not only the gods but the ancestors your dependents your teachers who are of your father's age your agraja the doctors and also the educated ones the brahmins okay and you should be treating whom uh, with great respect your teacher in archery who furnished you with excellent arrows and darts and also taught you political economy. Okay, so Sudhanva. And then he also explains to Bharata that the ministers should also be valiant, learned and masters of their senses. They should have control over their senses so that they don't indulge in corruption. Okay, and they should be of noble worth, skilled in interpreting internal sex sentiments by external gestures and such ministers you should assign to yourself. Now he comes to a very crucial thing. He says, the source of victory for a king comes from a concealed counsel from a minister. Okay. From which ministers? From those ministers who are well-versed in political sciences and who can hide their thoughts within themselves. If you read Arthashastra, you will find this is resonating in Kautilya. Now Kautilya, in very beginning, he says, I am paying obeisance to my Purvacharyas and I am codifying what my Purvacharyas have written and taught. He is very clear. And in his Purvacharyas, he writes all the names starting from Brihaspati. So the Indian tradition is very clear about it. We pay homage to our Purvacharyas. And then, you know, this famous story go, we might have watched the Chandragupta serial of uh, Divedi, uh, I forget his name, Chandrakant Divedi or somebody. Uh, 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 so, Divedi. Uh, yes. Uh, so he, he says, no, Chandragupta Maurya cannot sleep for more than four hours. Uh, and so Rama also tells to Bharata, I hope you do not fall to fall a prey to excess of sleep. Okay, and do wake up at appropriate time. I hope you contemplate during the later half of the night. So I never had the privilege of writing this uh, joint entrance examination. I think most of you have had. So early morning time is the best time to study. Waking up at Brahma Murta when the world is at peace and the human mind. I think that's the fertile time. That's what our rishis have also told us. And then he cautions him that you should not deliberate alone, okay? Neither sh you should deliberate the same thing with numerous people. You should deliberate with the right people and your deliberations should not flow to the public. Okay? This is something very important. And then he tells, oh Bharata, I hope you should be con considering your interest fully, your interest as a king. And when you launch any undertaking, so you should see that it gives you the maximum benefit with the minimum cost. And once it, you are assured that it will give you the maximum benefit with the minimum cost, you should not delay in launching it. So now, you know, we have uh, the oldest city civilization uh, in uh, the Mohenj greater Mohenjo-daro Harappan region, the Indus Saraswati civilizational region, date back to 8,000 8, years. So I do not enter the, in, wish to enter into the debate regarding the dating of the Ramayana and Mahabharata, but um, we can 
place the uh, Ramayana within a range of 6000 BCE. Hmm. And uh, the Indian mind talking of all these facets uh, in, uh, in, six, in, the, in this range is something very wonderful. Okay. And uh, uh, he also cautions that as a king, nobody, others should not be knowing about your inquiries or your strategies or any other approaches you should not be mentioning. Neither should you tell about your about the details of your discussion uh, that you make with the ministers. Okay, this is something thing. So he says, you should solicit advice from one wise man instead of soliciting the same from a thousand stupid people. Okay, one wise man can be of great help to you in difficult matters. So even if a king employs thousands or ten thousands of fools, they will not be of any help to him. But even if one wise, valiant, sagacious and efficient minister is there, he will be able to cause uh, to secure a great prosperity to the king. Now, when he is able to cross great prosperity uh, to the king, to the king means to obviously to the state, to the Rajya. Okay, because uh, again, if I take the uh, sloka or the idea from Artha Shastra, from it says that what is pleasing to the king is not uh, which is dear to him. What is dear to his praja is only what is pleasurable to him. Prajasukhitam ragyam, prajanam chapriyam hitam. So, uh, and he also tells that you should appoint su superior servants and the superior servant should be assigned superior works only. Mediocre people should be assigned mediocre work and people who are not good should not be assigned very high quality work. And you should be assigning ministers who are eminent, incorruptible, born uh, of noble fathers and there are bearers of good family and those who have self-integrity in matters of great importance. And, you know, you should also be careful that your ministers do not watch as mere witnesses, okay, while your subjects are trembling with fear or under your inflexible wielding of the skeptic. Your minister should not, they should advise you, they should knock you, that your people are not doing well under your care. So he says that people who work for you, people who perform your yagya should not hold you in contact and should not accept terrible gifts for, from you. Women should not hold you in contempt. Hmm. So these are the things these are mentioned. Okay. And then this discussion goes on and he comes to the question of the army. He says that you should have an army chief who is cheerful, wise, courageous, valiant, well-behaved, born in a good family, who is beloved by his subordinates and efficient, he is select. Uh, such an army chief should be selected by you. And he talks about the warriors, the soldiers who should be excellent, strong, skilled in warfare, excellent actions, courageous ones are, should be duly honored by him. But he also tells you that the army should be regularly paid their salary should be regularly given and their provisions should never be cut down. Okay, their provisions should be given to me. So there should not be any delay in giving bread and wages. When there is any delay in giving bread and wages, people who work for you, okay, they tend to go against you and become corrupt. And then insubordination happens, unfortunate citizens, unfortunate situations happen. So then he mentions about the Kshatriya race and he tells them that you should good, take good care of them who are ready to 
steadfastly work for you and forsake anything hmm, for you okay and then he comes to the question of selecting an ambassador hmm. selecting an ambassador and he says that a knowledgeable man who is living in your own country a wise man a skilled man uh, who is endowed with the presence of mind who knows how to speak to the point should only be selected as an ambassador by you nobody else okay so then you know he talks about the spy systems he says for each occasion you should have three sets of spies not one but three okay so if i have to have a spy on commander jetly i will have three people if i have to have a spy on you i'll have three people watching over you and if three people tell me yes sir is doing good work then i give sir a sena medal i don't know which is the medal in the navy but i decorate sir with the sena medal so that is how the three spies each of the spy will not know that the other is working as a spy this is the system that is valmiki elucidates in the ramayana very important three different spies working on on the same assignment each not knowing the other is working very important and then there are you know 18 functionaries of the enemy and the 15 functionaries of the own side so these are elucidated 18 functionaries are elucidated the chief minister the king's family priest the crown prince the leader of the army the chief warder the chamberlain the chamberlain is the adhyaksha of the antapura okay uh, the superintendent of the jails he is the uh, inspector of jails okay inspector general of prison karagar adhyaksha the chancellor of exchequer the herald the government advocate the judge the assessor the officer disbursing salaries to the army men the officer drawing money from the state exchequer to disburse the workmen's wages the superintendent of public works the protector of the borders of a kingdom who also performed the duties of a forester the magistrate and the officer entrusted with the con conservation of waters hills forest and tracts difficult to access okay now these are the details that valmiki is giving so we get a whole compact social picture and a picture of the indic polity okay so this and then there are the 15 functionaries of the king's own side okay which are the first three is omitted the chief minister is omitted the king's family priest is omitted the crown prince is omitted okay and after that rama advises bharata never think weakly of your foes never take pakistan lightly never take china lightly okay never take anybody lightly and if you are expelled return back i think this is a very important lesson Prithira Chauhan expels Mohammad Ghori. Ghori returns back. He should have been finished then. I hope uh, you should not be honoring the materialistic Brahmins. Okay, you should not be honoring honoring those who are perverted in mind, those who are ignorant, and those who think that they are learned. You should not be honoring such people. Rama makes him very clear okay uh, people who are perverted intellect they preach meaninglessly meaninglessly huh? and um, in before them presence of eminent books on righteousness logical acumens everything fades into insignificance because they won't buy this thing and then he tells bharata that you should preserve the city of ayodhya you should ensure that everything is furnished and everything is flourishing that that exactly the way it was by our heroic ancestors okay by the ragukulas and 
you should do it worthy of your name. Ayodhya, a city which is an impregnable fortress, which has, which has never been conquered, which cannot be fought against with its fortified gates, its elephant, horses, chariots, Brahmins, warriors, merchants. Okay. They are all engaged in their respective duties. Its noble citizens, self-controlled and full of energies with its palaces in various shapes and the learned who abound there. Now somebody here, I guess in the chat box, raised a question, what are the key takeaways in the case of democracy? I'll just briefly answer it. Since I know, I do not know answers to all the questions. I'm myself a learner, a student. Let me acknowledge that fact. So I will answer since I think I can answer this point from Ramayana. When Dasharatha wants to announce Rama is the crown prince. He doesn't go to the Rajya Sabha and makes an announcement from tomorrow Rama is going to. He calls for a Sabha. And in that Sabha, he invites everybody from Ayodhya, all the members of the Sabha, Sabha Sadha. So, message is sent to all corners of the territory, Sadayu Mandala. Okay? Everyone comes, they attend. And even before Dasharatha is able to make the announcement that Rama will be the Yuvaraja, the Sabhasada starts a clamor for making Rama the Yuvaraja. This is the essence of democracy. And the essence of democracy is found in many of our temple inscriptions also. Okay, in South India also, where you have, you know, uh, the sabhas and the samitis were engaged in voting and other things also. So the Indians went on uh, following this, though at the head it was the king and even there was the Chakravartin. When the king performed the Ashwamedha and the Rajasuya, the Chakravartin was the first among the equal. He did not necessarily went killing everybody. He was given that prestige because he was a dharma purusha. That was the essence of the democratic system. We always need not think, uh, uh, pardon me for saying this, uh, the West is not bad. But uh, it would be absurd to believe uh, that we would have the same uh, track of thought or the line of evolution as the Westers had it. So we might have had our different line of thought, different line of civilizational inquiry and all that. Okay. Uh, so, then he goes about that the kingdom adorned with peaceful places, rich in temples, shades, where water stored for distribution to passerbys uh, in tanks with happy men and women, graced by social festivities, with land well tilled, abiding in cattle, which are totally free from cruelties, cattle totally free from cruelties, the agricultural land not exclusively fed by wren, which is beautiful and purged of beasts of prey, which is completely rid of fears, studded with minds, destitute of sinful men, and should be prosperous and peaceful of peaceful ab abode of happiness just as our forefathers ensured it. And all those who cherish and live by agriculture and cattle rearing should prosper well and their prosperity should be ensured. All the maintenance should be looked after, after you and there should not be any fear. And all the citizens, it is their right to be protected by a king through righteousness. And even women should not be feel fearful and they should be treated well and their secrets well protected. Then you should be also supervising and protecting the woods inhabited by the elephants. You should ensure that the female elephants are in good number and you should not simply satisfy yourself with the existing population of female elephants, horses and male elephants alone. You should always work on increasing the numbers. Uh, 
just before the, if I'm not wrong, beginning of the great war of uh, Mahabharata, um, uh, there is this, um, uh, Dhritarashtra is having sleepless nights. He's not getting sleep. So with the advice of sage Krishna Dvaipayana Vedavyasa, sage Parasara comes to counsel him. And there he says in one of the shlokas in the course of the discourse to Dhritarashtra, he says, wild animals protect the forest. The forest protects the wild animal. I don't recollect the shloka now. So in British India, the forest cover in India was more than 40%. So when the British wanted the timber to lay the railway tracks in India and in the European war theater, they cleaned our forests. The forest cover dwindled from 44% to about 21% in independent India. The tiger population dwindled from more than a lakh to, I think, less than a few thousands. So this gives us an adequate picture how the wild protects the wild and vice versa. So, <clears throat> and he says that uh, you should be, the prince Bharata, you should be regally adorned. You should appear before the people early in the morning on the highway, on the Rajpath, and you should greet them. What a beautiful thing. You should greet them. You should not wait for the people to greet them. You should greet them. I remember of one thing. Uh, this I did not have the good fortune to meet uh, Paramachari of Kanchi, uh, Mahaswami Chandrasekhar and this uh, Saraswati Swamigal. So in one of his discourses, he said, Sri Rama had this characteristic thing in him that he would not ever give any credit to him. He would always give credit to his teammates, be it Lakshmana, be it Dubishana, be it uh, Hanumana, Angad, Nala, Neela, Sugriva, Jambavan, or later coming back, Bharata, anybody. Okay? He would never take credit for himself. This is one of the high core of leadership that Rama always practiced and believed. Okay. And he says that you should not ever adopt a disrespectful attitude towards anybody. Okay. Uh, in case it is required, you may follow a middle course of action. Okay. And you make sure that your granary is full of grain, your warehouse is full of material, your weaponry is full of weapons, your treasury is full of money, okay? Your tanks are full of water, your mechanical setup is all good, roads are all good, wells are well maintained, Artisans are taken care of, archers are taken care of, and income of the state is abundant, but expenditure is taken care of. Okay? And your treasure does not reach undeserving people. You should not award undeserving people. Koyake kehta hai, wah, tum kya raja ho, aur tum usko koi kuch gift deta ho, de dete ho, ye kab so, but at the same time, your expenditure should also go for the cause of divinity. It should also go for the cause of those who are uncared for, unprotected for, for the educated. It should go to take care of unexpected visitors, widows, okay? And it should take care of soldiers and it also should go in hosting friends and uh, then something again important uh, if someone of noble work 
despite his honesty and integrity, is falsely implicated of some offense, make sure that he is not killed impatiently. You launch a due inquiry only by those who are well versed in the law books because it is extremely important that a noble man should be protected at all cost. So in Mahabharata, Vidura does an examination when Yudhishthira and Duryodhana comes of the comes of age. He doesn't conducts an, an examination at the advice of Bhishma Pitamha of uh, in to select the crown prince who should be the crown prince of Hastinapura. So Duryodhana acts though he is very just king he acts extremely impatiently and that is where he loses out to uh, Yudhishthira and Yudhishthira is selected as the crown prince. Okay. Hmm. And then he also makes sure that uh, nobody should be you know, let go of because somebody is wealthy. Or nobody should be punished less because somebody is wealthy and he is able to use his wealth as a means to uh, reduce his punishment. Hmm. And he also further says, advises Bharata that your well-educated ministers should examine a case dispassionately when a contention occurs between a rich man and a poor man and they should study the situation extremely carefully okay uh, then he cautions bharata the tears that falls from the eyes of a victim who is falsely accused such tears destroys their sons and hearts of those who are indifferent to justice. You have to be extremely care of, my dear Bharata. That's what Rama tells. No unjust person should ever be punished. Okay? And um, he says that you should greet your teachers, the elderly, the ascetics, the deities, the unexpected visitors, even the trees standing at the crossroads and all the educated, the Brahmins of auspicious life and conduct. Not the greedy Brahmins, the Brahmins of auspicious life and conduct. So this is what he says that, to them. And he says that you should always endow yourself, he repeatedly says, with great wisdom and you should have atheism, you should uh, my name, abhor, huh? atheism, falsehood, anger, carelessness, procrastination, disregard of the wise, sloth, bondage to the five senses, all these things he keeps on mentioning. Okay? And then he says that you should deal properly with the ten evils. He elucidates the ten evils and he says that the ten evils are the uh, four kinds, five kinds of fortifications, huh? and uh, four expedients, seven limbs of state, three branches of learnings, and all that he says. Okay, so then he also says that there is this hunting. A king is required to go on mrigaya, so unnecessary going on mrigaya is not required. So if you read uh, the tradition in uh, Valmiki Ramayana, so whenever a king goes on Mrigaya, there is some sort of a problem, whether it is in the case of Dasharatha or in the case, slightly in the case in later in Mahabharata, in the case of Pandu, or maybe the meeting of uh, Ganga and uh, Dushyanta. Okay. So there is some problem. So hunting, gambling, sleeping during the day, lustfulness, inebriation, pride. Okay. All these things he elucidates. And 
then again he towards the end of this discourse he says that i remind you to consult with three or four ministers as mentioned in the scripture so valmiki also though we call valmiki adi kavi so valmiki also has his purvacharyas so here it is mentioned as mentioned in the scriptures and you collect the proposal sing individually from them and comply with each other and meet them secretly individually do not tell them and you study the shastras the vedas and you benefit from the uh, company of your concerts keep your conviction strong and you know achieve long life fame religious merit enjoyment of wealth okay and uh, when you eat do not eat all the nice food yourself share it with your friends who seek it okay a wise and learned king having obtained and ruled the entire earth thus properly by righteousness and administering justice to the people indeed ascends heaven when detached detached from the mortal body so this is what rama tells very succinctly to bharata in the 100th chapter of varma book 2 ayodhya kanda second canto of valmiki ramayana uh, and then you know we have the yuddha kanda uh, uh, something very important happens here uh something very important happens here is that uh, none of the wars that we see in ramayana or in mahabharata are fought in the city precincts no city is disturbed or destroyed rama's army does not enter or violate the city of lanka mahabharata also no city is destroyed during the war when jarasandha repeatedly attacks mathura after kamsa's death krishna thinks it is wise to relocate from mathura to dwarka so civilizationally speaking when alexander it is quite unfortunate that our textbooks still call him alexander the great that is another story i hope anyp will clear that problem <laughs> sorry for the translation couldn't help it so when uh, uh, alexander attacked takshashila he attacked takshashila at night indians could not think that uh, somebody could attack at night there is this famous king of travancore again i'm forgetting his name uh, who wanted to fight the dutch uh, commander that was you know the dutch were the height of european power and that's the only time when the dutch were defeated okay that was the indian king who defeated the dutch so he writes a letter to the dutch commander he says buddy we will fight on some day in this field and we are going to fight and while we march with our armies outside we are not going to disturb the habitation on both sides when we march and we will start our fighting with the rising sun and we will stop at at the setting sun after the sun sets we will be friends we will stand we will attend to the injured on the battlefield we will honor the dead and all that when the dutch commander governor receives the letter he thinks this is a war or a game he doesn't understand that he doesn't understand the indic tradition the war is fought and the indians win the war king ah see so i got the answer king martanda varma of travancore yeah the famous martanda varma of travancore no doubt his name is martanda varma okay so that tradition the indians continue you watch any bollywood movie you will see when the army of the pharaoh or anybody is marching they or even later in the second world war hitler wanted the scorched earth policy so the vegetation on both side is burned so that if the enemy army wins and they comes they have nothing to eat okay so that is the tradition anyway the tradition continues so i at the end 
of uh, uh, the war, Ravana lies vanquished in the battlefield and uh, Rama instructs Lakshmana, we know this famous story, to go to Ravana and request for his knowledge. Lakshmana goes and asks Ravana impatiently. Ravana refuses to reply. Then Rama goes and sees, tells, uh, shows how to ask befittingly from a king. After all, Ravana is a king and he should be treated as a king. And uh, then this famous uh, shloka is there, Svarnam in Lanka, that Rama says that a golden Lanka is not dearer to me. The mother and the motherland is more dearer to me. It had a direct effect during the Indian freedom movement also. This was oft quoted. If you enter the precincts of the Kali temple at Dakshineshwar, which was the Leela Bhumi of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, as you enter through the main door in the courtyard, the shloka is inscribed there. You will feel very happy. Okay. So uh, that sets again the uh, context of Ramayana in the in the modern modern uh, context. Okay. Now uh, during during uh, the coronation of Bhivishana, Rama had promised that he will not. He was in Vanavasa. He will not enter the city. He does not enter the city during Vibhishana's coronation. He sends his emissary. His does, army does not enter Lanka. He sends his emissary, Lakshmana, Hanuman, Jambavan, Angad, Sukriv. They attend Vibhishana's coronation inside Lanka. And then when they come back to Ayodhya, at the request of Bharata, Rama accepts the offer and he sits on a seat. His coronation will happen. Bharata and Rama, they take their bath and they get adorned for the occasion. Rama mounts an excellent chariot. This is description we get from book six of Yuddhakanda. He moves forth in a procession through the city, accompanied by Bharata, Shatrugna, Lakshmana and Vibhishana. Then there are several thousand uh, elephants and other things there. The monkeys are there, attendants, musicians, various musical instruments. The citizens of Ayodhya are very happy. They hoist flags on every house. Rama returns to his paternal palace in Ayodhya. Sugriva orders four of his monkeys to bring waters from four oceans in jars given to them. Some monkeys brings ocean from various rivers, rivers are mentioned in hundreds. They bring water from various uh, oceans also. Vashishta comes along with other Brahmin priests. They consecrate Rama with the sacred waters. The ministers, the warriors, the merchants, the gods, okay. They sprinkle sap and other kinds of herb on Rama. Vashishta himself officiate the coronation ceremony and then Rama gives away presents to priests as well as to Sukriva and Angada. So if you look at this during the coronation ceremony, there is the tradition of kings giving away presents. The kings also give away presents during Ashwamedha and Rajasuya. This tradition continues in India. Various kings in the Indian dynasty have styled themselves after Rama. Even Yudhishthira's rule was Rama Rajya. Harshavardhana's rule was Rama Rajya. Was what Harshavardhana did in Prayagaraj during the Kumbha was essentially what Rama would have also done during while conducting any sacrifice, whether it was Ashtumeda, Vajpaya, or during his coronation or during, during any celebration at Ayodhya. Okay. Rama presents, gives presents to his friends, Bibhishana, Sugriva, Jambavana. Sita presents that necklace to Hanuman. There is the story pearl necklace to Hanuman. Okay. But Lakshmana does not give his consent to be appointed the crown prince. So then Rama looks to Bharata. Okay. To become the prince regent. Okay. And uh, Rama is pro then uh, 
Bharata becomes the king regent and you know Rama has a long rule. So when you have a very long rule, you says it says that uh, you uh, it is described in thousands. So Valmiki says that Ram, Rama enjoyed kingship for ten thousand years, and Rama performed many sacrifices like Pandarika, Ashwamedha, Vajpayee, and all these things. Okay, and Rama has Ajanuvahu, long arms which reach up to his knees. He has broad chest. And with Bharata and Lakshmana by his sides and Shatrugna, he ruled this earth gloriously. Now, coming to his exact leadership qualities. Now, Rama is the king. It is no more Bharata the regent. So what does Valmiki tells us exactly? Number one, while Rama was ruling the ki kingdom, there was no widows to lament. The state took care of the widows. There was no danger from wild animals. The forest was taken care of. The forest was fenced. Nor any fear born of diseases. So pharmacology was present. Enough doctors were there. If there was any disease outbreak, it was checked then and there. The world was bereft of thieves and robberies. In Ram Rajya, people slept with open doors. There were no thieves and robberies. No one felt worthless, nor did old people run away or feel shy from youngsters. Every creature felt pleased. Everyone was intent on virtue. Turning their eyes towards Rama alone, creatures did not kill one another. I personally had a similar feeling when I looked at the Sri Rama idol crafted by my friend Arun Jogiraj uh, during the Pranapatishta ceremony. I'm a believer, so it was natural for me though. Uh, so while Rama was ruling the kingdom, people survived for a long time with their progeny and they were all free of grief and free from illness. And when Rama ruled the kingdom, People centered around Rama, Rama and only Rama, as if the world became Rama's work. It was Ramo Mayam Jagat. The trees bore flowers and fruits regularly without any injury by pests and insects. The clouds were raining in time and the wind was delightful to touch. The priestly class, the warrior class, the merchants and the agriculturists the servant class, they all performed their own duties, satisfied, <coughs> excuse me, they, <coughs> they were satisfied with their own work and they were freed from grief. While Rama was ruling, people were genuinely intent on virtue and lived without telling lies. All the people were endowed with excellent characteristics, all were engaged in virtue. That is why Rama was engaged in kingship for long time, never ending times. So Rama Rajya became a concept. So it says in this world, whoever person reads and Valmiki says, reads and listens to this foremost lyric derived from the speech of a sage, which is endowed with righteousness. That's how I began conferring fame and longevity fetching victory to kings and as written at first by Valmiki, that person is delivered from all misfortune. Okay. On So even as Kausalya, the mother has Rama as a living son or as Sumitra has Lakshmana or Kaikeyi has Bharata, the women likewise can become mothers of living sons endowed with children as well as grandchildren and thus become happy forever. So this goes on, then there is some kind of a halashruti by Valmiki about the epic. And he ends by saying that Rama gets forever pleased with whom, with him who reads or listens to Ramayana, for indeed he is the eternal Vishnu or the preserver or the caretaker. And he is identified with the primordial God, clearly pleased with the beautiful eyes. Huh. 
and the lotus eyes with the shesha who is none other than lakshmana so with this long narrative which should be listened imbibed by good people seeking wisdom longevity health fame fraternity intelligence welfare and brilliance and may i add good for the country working for nation building and if i broaden the scope working for international welfare okay the whole world is now the geography has shrunk the whole world is a committee of nation speaking for international brotherhood i think uh, the concept of ramarajya has enough to offer to us in terms of leadership goals in terms of how to bring together people together in terms of how to honor those who are learned in terms of how to build ethical platforms and the like uh, there was one more question is there like uh, you know on uh, uh, the constitution and uh, uh, ramayana um, so you know uh, the so origin ramayana. can you kindly explain how today's women should follow the path of dharma in the light of curricula of women of ramayana and mahabharata period anadi anand has asked this question okay i'll come to it just before that uh, i'll just tell this so when the constitution was being debated in the constituent assembly during the third reading of the constitution sometime in november 19 i may be wrong with the date again 1948 uh yes hanumantayya member from mysore state he stands up and questions dr ambedkar uh, he gives a long speech and he says i do not blame you because you are all educated in the west but we were here to hear the sweet music of sitar but you have subject us subjected us to a cacophony of an english band so the original uh, copy of the indian constitution is written in calligraphy it's there in a helium case in the constitution hall archives okay and uh, it has been beautifully decorated by nandalal bose and his students and the first page starts uh, with a, a picture of Uh, illustration of Sri Rama, Lakshmana, Sita, the Ram Darbar in his style. So that is uh, the uh, you know the impact of uh, Rama on the modern Indian uh, democracy. Uh, we thought that India began in for many thought that India began in nineteen forty seven. Gandhi ji always aspired for Ram Rajya. Un unfortunately, words like Ram Rajya, Swarajya. panchayat gram surajya did not find any mention in the constitution at all so when this was taken to gandhi ji gandhi ji said let them do whatever they are doing in the constituent assembly we will think about it later but that's a different story that uh, history took a different shape okay now coming to uh, uh, answering this question i will answer this question uh, uh, with uh, a little bit of a historical movie if you look uh, at the names of women women characters from the stories of uh, from ramayana and mahabharata then you will see that um, they are uh, named uh, the queens are named after the states the rajyas they come from kai kai comes from kai kai hmm. uh, then um, Sita is called Janaki. She is the daughter of Janaka, or she is the daughter of Videha. Videhi Putri is also she is called. Okay, uh, and then uh, if you go to Mahabharata, you will see Madhya Desha Sya Kanya Iti Madri Kunti Bhoja Sya Kanya Iti Kunti, uh, and uh, uh, then uh, Draupadi's name is K uh, Krishna. She is Draupadi Sya Kanya Iti Draupadi uh, Panchala Sya Putri Iti Panchali. Gandharasya Kanya Iti Gandhari, okay. So these are there. They are known by that name. And Kunti's original name is Pritha. Hence, Krishna calls Arjuna Parth. Hmm. So in Mahabharata, there is a beautiful uh, chapter which is called 
Dropadi Satyabhama Sambada. In Dropadi Satyabhama Sambada, which happens when the Pandavas have established Indraprastha and uh, the Rajasuya is being performed, and Draupadi is Samragi, she is the Empress, and Yudhishthira is the Emperor. So Satyabhama, Rukmini and Satyabhama, Satyabhama is the junior wife of Sri Krishna, Dwarakadhi Sri Krishna. They visit they visit uh, Indraprastha and Draupadi explains what kind of a multitasking she has to do. And she makes it clear that though the Pandavas might be alpha male and they have a whole empire to look after, it is Draupadi whose writ runs in the royal household. There, the, even the Pandava brothers submit to her wishes. And what does Draupadi do? Draupadi takes care of all the thousand visitors who come to the royal court every day and they're all fed. Okay, so one of my professors once told that if you go uh, to the home of uh, 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 Mr. Sri Ramachandran, you know, who was the chief minister of Tamil Nadu before Jailalita, if you go to his house with some work, he will make sure that if you arrive during the breakfast time, you are given some breakfast. If you go during the lunch time, you are given some lunch. And if you are given go during some other time, you are given some snacks. So only if you have that, your paper will be accepted. So that was the custom in his place. Now, there is something else to ponder about the story of Ahalya and Rama from Ramayana gives us an uh, uh, word of Ahalya Mukti and also Rama's interaction with Shabari. Though I would also be tempted to mention Rama's interaction with Guhan. A king cannot afford to discriminate between high and low. Once you become a king, you are above discrimination. So that would be my brief take on that. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So nice, Prabhalda. Malab, you have uh, touched up so many parts of Ramayana and the lessons which we can learn. It's really incredible. I think many of us may be feeling that why we have not studied Ramayana thoroughly till to date. Probably many of us will be encouraged to go deep into what the Ramayana can teach and what uh, the wisdom of Valmiki. I think uh, all of us would like to bow our head before Valmiki ji, who wrote so much, so much in detail about the various incidents and described and how a king should behave, how Rama is giving advice to Bharata and then how Rama performed his duties. It's really amazing. If there is any other question directly by anybody, just raise your hand, please. One or two questions. We are reaching our end of the time. Just please go ahead. Anybody? Yes, Hello. who is there? Uh, this is Kishore here. Yeah, please yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to know that from which book uh, Prabhupada read the, those things? Can you name the name of the book? Uh, well, not from any particular book, but these are some assorted notes. Um, if you want, I will. I can share the notes through uh, Commander Jetley. Yeah, yeah, that would be nice. Definitely, definitely. We will. We will publish. Fine. Good. Thanks. Thanks. Can you keep the full screen on? Yeah, matrix form. Anybody else? Uh, sir, I wanted to ask a question, though I am not able to raise my hand. No problem, Rija. Go ahead. Okay. So good evening, sir. So, <laughs> sir, you already know me. So I have a question or rather uh, maybe an insight, maybe if you could throw light that you have really very nicely talked about the whole, uh, you know, as a Lord Ram as the Maryada Purushottam and how you've talked about him being fair and just regarding his social, economic, political ecosystem that is surrounding Lord Ram and his whole regime. So if you could just probably very briefly could uh, just state that does this uh, whole concept of Purushuttam, Maryada Purushuttam extends to his personal life as well? Because that is always something which people question him regarding why was this, you know, like they say, ki ek dhobi ki baat pe he preferred to abandon his wife. So this is one thing if you could just briefly explain or you can talk about. Uh, well, uh, the first thing is once you become a queen, a king, you re lose your personal self. You are the king. 
you don't have a personal self to say. Now, there's one more thing to look at here is uh, we will also have to think of keep in mind of the time and the social structure and the requirement of the time of Valmiki's age or the age of Ramayana and subsequently the times of Mahabharata and all that. Now, there is also this controversy that the last portion is a later addendum. It was not part of the original scheme of Valmiki. And uh, that, I mean, the Uttarakhanda is not, that is the scholarly opinion, that traditional scholarly opinion, that Uttarakhanda is not part of the original corpus of Valmiki's Srimad Ramayana. So that is there, but uh, Rama's uh, concept of, or his being Maryada Purushottama, uh, I don't think it gets challenged in any way because he as a king has to satisfy every stakeholder in his state. But then uh, the question obviously comes that he is you have a wife at home and you are not treating her properly. Uh, this becomes a bit problematic and that is why probably you do not have anybody in Indian civilization who is named after Sita, though you have people named the Janaki. Okay. Uh, Subhash Chandra Bose's father was named Janaki Nath Bose and all that you have. So that is there. Thank you, sir. So, uh, sir, I have a question to ask. Actually, it is not correct. People are named after Sita in South India. And okay. Sita is quite a common name. I, my wife is from Karnataka. Her cousin's name is Sita. Her friend's name is Sita. So it's... Okay, it's fine. Thank you. And so is Sita Pati. Fine. Huh. Okay. Fine. Uh, Devinder Singh, please go ahead. Well, with folded hands and my deepest reverence to all, First of all, thank you very much, uh, Professor Roy Chaudhary. My question to you is, in this Kalyuga, what are the three things that you would suggest to youngsters to bring back the Ram Rajya? Thank you. I would suggest first and foremost that we should be uh, grounded in our civilizational ethos and cultural moorings. Once we do that, rest of the things will fall in place. We need not negate anything. If we are rooted in our civilizational ethos and cultural moorings, whatever we get, we can adapt to it and still not lose our parampara, our heritage. So a good point to begin will definitely be reading the Ramayana, reading our Itihasas and knowing our heritage. So I'll have this one point agenda only, which I have been following myself. Great. That's really Thank you. very Thank nice you of you. Much. Yeah. Uh, what you said is very right. Uh, we, our moorings in our own culture, in our teachings, one, the amount of knowledge which is there in our scriptures is really great. No other civilization in any part of the world can match this type of wisdom which is there in Ramayana, Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, and so many other things. I think there's a need for us to recognize our strength, learn that. And then probably the so-called modern knowledge from the modern books, we should be able to compare. And yes, let's not close our windows, as you said in the beginning itself. Let the noble thoughts come from all sides. So with that, I think I will straight away now invite Partho Da, Partho Ghosh, our founder chairman, kindly conclude, sir. Well, it will be very difficult to conclude. It's an ongoing dialogue. Uh, because what touched me, the couple of words that I would like to highlight which came out of Dr. Roy Chaudhary's discourse, the truthfulness and righteousness and the valor at the center of what the Ram Rajya was all about. And out of that, I picked up 10 big messages, uh, which I would love to share, but it will take a lot of time, but I just quickly touched on. I think the first was very clear that everything that was fermenting in the Ram Rajya was around righteousness, it was around resilience, it was around teamwork, 
I mean, Hanuman is part of the team, about servant leadership, about uh, humility, about empathy, about forgiveness. So all the key things that we talk about when we talk about leadership were celebrated uh, during the time of Ram Rajya. The big question that we have to all work on, and I don't think we can answer today, that if it was so good that time, what I particularly liked, that the focus was how to sustain that. How come we lost that Rajya, that concept? That's a very important question that we have to first understand so that once again, as Commander, you were talking about, we reconnect with our past, how to celebrate it in a way that we could sustain it, not only for the nation, but for the world. How did it get lost? If it's so good, how come literally India got invaded, India got tortured, India got, uh, you know, all of you are familiar with what happened in the last 1500 years. But if the concept was preserved and it was so fundamental, how could we lose it? I think that's something we have to work on. I think that should be the task of the Academy of Leadership, so that we could work with Dr. Roy Chaudhary and others who have been doing scholarly work in this area, that we could truly celebrate. Because, you know, I think he, he talked about duties and responsibilities, but I see that as being totally neglected in today's India, perhaps th thousand years ago, because if we did not let them, neglect them, India wouldn't have been invaded. So I think we have to ask the question, how to put it in the roots and practice it every nanosecond. So that indeed we could create a model society, not only model for the country, but model for the world. So this is a big takeaway that I would like to particularly work on in the next 10, 15 years of the development of the academy. So thank you thank very you, much. Prabhuda. Thank you, thank you. Uh, one more thing I am reminded of what uh, Prabhulda said just now. Uh, Rama gave credit to his team always. Whatever they achieved, they said, oh, you have done a great job. You have done a great job. That's a great quality of a teacher who gives a leader, who gives credit to his team. And one more thing which you mentioned, I am really very happy to note that. Rama, when he tells Bharata that do not delay once you want to launch a big program or big, some big scheme for your people, just do it. That's like a quick decision making, which many times the leaders, they delve into what is called, you know, Analysis and analysis and analysis that cause and paralysis. And paralysis. Analysis. So he is saying, you know, go for the quick decision. That is what I really liked. Even those days, they thought about that. I am really happy to know that. So with that, I think we are coming to the end of our talk. So may I request uh, Pranav Patel ji to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, that was really great. Uh, Jackie, uh, just uh, if I are uh, given one minute. Take care, Majumdar. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Last Actually, time. In the morning when I received your message, I was wondering that what is it all about Ram and all. So, but I, however, I accepted and I said, yes, I, I will uh, attend it. But the kind of information I got it from Pravalda, it's really mind blowing. I mean, I never had the idea that uh, he could uh, discuss this dimension of Ramayana. And uh, the most important part I uh, learned from today's uh, presentation was the diversity and protection of environment. He spoke about the forest reservation, forestation, and, and keeping the animals. And, uh, he, and the most important thing is the gender diversity within the animals, that females to be given more preference. And rightly so, in the recently uh, inaugurated Ram Temple complex, there was a, a statue of Garuda the bird which saved Sita. So th that also to indicate that uh, even the, uh, the lower rung of the animal or the bird has been projected and it didn't worship. So that shows that the kind of uh, biodiversity or sustainability was taken care of. Actually, I uh, asked a question to know more insight from uh, Pravalda about the ESG component in Ram Rajya. But uh, whatever, I mean, whatever I learned from his talk, it's indeed uh, very, very eye-opening. And that's why I requested the scripture which she followed uh, so that I can refer more content to understand the biodiversity part or the environment. Thank you, KK. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Parna, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, Jai Siaram to everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, 
professor prabal chaudhary for this wonderful illustrious explanation of uh, leadership qualities which rama has given us and what ramayana talks of especially focusing on the ayodhya kan and kachit sarga where he actually rama teaches bharata and i would say rama, rama is in the teachers mode where he is teaching bharata how to rule the kingdom in his absence and how a leader should be or a king should be so thank you very much for taking us through and uh, making our series of uh, uh, lectures on leadership more enriched by this particular uh, lecture here i would also like to thank our founder uh, professor pathagosh for joining in and spending some time with us our chairman uh, professor vk uh, professor uh, shailendra vashne commander vk jetli who is our board of advisors other regular uh, uh, joinees especially uh, Uh, Madhusudan Chaudhary sir, uh, uh, Prabhat Mitra sir, thank you very much all for your support. Vijay Narayan sir, thank you very very much all for joining in. For all of you others viewers, uh, we keep doing these lectures once a month. We have a leader lecture on leadership, and uh, I would request all of you to follow us on our social media, uh, which is Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn. We keep regularly posting about the lectures that we have. Apart from that, if you have already uh, registered with us, then you will get regular emails from us on this upcoming lectures and the series that we are conducting. So thank you very much. Wish you all a very good evening. I think we'll take a photograph, uh, uh, a group photograph for all. Uh, so request others also who have not uh, switched on their camera. I see people joining. A lot of people joining in from United States as well uh, in this particular session. So really glad to have all of you here for this session. Wow! In fact, I am going to need two screens to take a screenshot today because uh, there are people around. So, first screen, please smile, please, and uh, one Switch more. Switch on videos, please. Yes, one more Switch on screen. Videos. Thank you for everyone, and give a smile. Yes, thank you, Vijayanarayan sir. Glad to see you there. Thank you, everyone. Wish you a great day in the United States. Okay, I, uh, I, I, just one minute. At that's, my end, I would just sir. like to um, thank you all for bearing with me and end with a universal prayer for all our well-being. Nikame nikame na parjanya varshatu falanya na oshadaya pachantam yoga kshe mahana kalpatam. स्वस्ति प्रजाभ्य पिपालयता मगे न महिम महिषा गो ब्राह्मणेभ्य शुभमस्तु नित्यं लोका समस्ता सुखिनो भवन्तु थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच जय श्री राम जय श्री राम थैंक यू थैंक यू एवरीवन ग्रेट